evening. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jana Hoffman, Chair of Art and Science Node, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our third event of Art and Science Synergy Program at Plant Biology Europe 2021. An exclusive Art and Science talk accompanying the virtual exhibition Capture the Futures, the Roots to Roots, Networks, and Beyond. Today, we dive to the root of the blue flower, which bridges past and the futures, the industrial revolution and the biotechnological revolution. For the key poet of romanticism and scientist, Wolfgang Goethe, the blue flower was Urpflanze, the prime plant, mentioned also in Darwin's The Origin of Species. Today, the blue flower of chicory become again a symbol, not in terms of romantic fantasies, but new horizons bridging nature and technology. Get the words, unnatural, that is too natural, assume new meaning. Art and Science Energy Program at PBE 2021 bridges two complex interdisciplinary projects, Rhizosphere, the big network of small worlds, and ISN Artists in Residence Program at Chic Innovation Consortium. Chic is the five years project in the frame of Horizon 2020, which aims at the establishment of a responsible innovation pathway for the development and application of new plant breeding techniques for chicory as a multi-purpose crop for the production of high value consumer products like inulin and medical terpenes. The consortium comprised 17 partners including Art and Science Node with the innovative strategy to disseminate st scientific knowledge through art. Anna Dimitriou and Alex May are our outstanding artists in residence in labs, working on fantastic artistic project, biotechnology from the blue flower with excellent scientists and experts from the Chicory Consortium. So let me introduce the participants of today's Art and Science meeting. Anna Dumitriou is award-winning, internationally renowned British artist with years-long experience in crossing borders between art, science, and technology. She is working in the field of bioart using sculpture, installation, and digital media to explore our relationship to infectious diseases, synthetic biology, and also robotics. Alex May works with a wide range of digital media, including virtual and augmented reality, algorithmic photography and interactive robotic artworks, video and sound art, questioning how our individual and collective experiences of time and formation of memories and cultural record are mediated, expanded, and directed by contemporary technologies. The list of the amazing artistic achievements would take the whole evening, so I would strongly encourage you to visit their websites. Anna and Alex has been mainly working with the Chic partners in the heart of the Chic Consortium, which is Facheningen. And we have today with us the Chic project leader, Professor Dirk Bosch from the Facheningen University and Research, microbiologist with 30 years experience in unraveling biosynthetic pathways that lead to the immense biodiversity of molecules found in plants. And he uses his research for bringing innovation to the agro-food and health sectors. Professor Dirk Bosch is an author of over 100 scientific publications, and I'm not count, I don't want to count citations, and around 20 independent patents in this field. And he is accompanied by Dr. Katya Kankar, also from Fahenningen University, who in the Chic project is involved in gene editing of chicory to produce improved food fibers and healthy terpenes. We have also with us scientists and experts from the global player, the crop innovation company Kijin, located also in Fahenningen. Dr. Paul Bundok, who is involved in the application of genome, genome editing technologies in plant breeding uh, and Eric Toussaint, 
who uh, by profession is chemist and botanist, but his passion is not only science, but science communication, especially biotechnology, making bridges between scientists and various audiences. So he joined Hijin in 2018 after more than 30 years of working at Fachingen University and research. And I'm strongly convinced that art is at the heart of science communication. Like today, the inspiration for this art and science meeting came from artists and their artwork, the biotechnology from the blue flower. The completed project will be available to public in 2022 but uh, for now, uh, we invite you to visit the exhibition, Capture the Futures, Our Biotech Planet at the Plant Biology Congress in the form of original website and innovative AR application. And I would like shortly to introduce you to this platform. I'll just share my screen. With this commented video guided tour, I will walk you through the fully virtual exhibition, Capture the Futures, Our Biotech Planet, The Roots to Roots, Networks and Beyond, Bridging the Worlds of Art, Science and Technology. It involves interdisciplinary conversations, which offer original paths to explore and reflect on interconnections between environmental, cultural and social political issues that shape both our present time and our futures. It provides an international survey of artworks and art projects created by artists inspired by scientific research and collaborating with scientists in the field of plant sciences, also biotechnology. On the search to pathways to renewal and recovery, we turn not only to the ingenuity of human creativity, new scientific discoveries or technological solutions, we explore also the inspiration coming from the biological worlds flourishing around root systems, the highly effective networks of the rhizosphere. Thus, understanding the world as a multifaceted environment gave rise to the concept of a root-like 3D interface. In its form, it refers to the root networks, while in its idea to the wood wide web concept of the underground world of communication. On your way to explore the artworks, you will find yourself passing through its subsequent levels. In the end, you will move around or even inside a root-like labyrinth, traveling through and experiencing our biotech planet. So we envisioned our global human network as the rhizosphere, expanding not only under our feet, but also everywhere around entwining the earth. It forms a delicate network of symbiosis, diversity, and interdependencies. We connect and interact with this biotech planet endlessly exchanging information. Our actions influence the network well-being. Our virtual exhibition combines various artistic approaches, practices, and technologies. The visuals you just saw constitute the structure of the first of its component, the original website. Together with augmented reality app, they give a broad perspective of experiencing the featured artworks. By opening the exhibition on the website, you move inside the interface and by traveling through the scenes, you will explore the artworks. You can control your journey in two different ways. By using bottom menu, you select specific artwork. By moving with the arrows, you can go forward or backward, and then your experience will be linear. The latter option will follow the complete narrative of the exhibition. And now, about the augmented reality app. You can get the art and science note application from both Google Play and App Store. Inside the app, our interface visualizing the exhibition's concept is used as a structure to move around it and explore artwork by artwork. Upon arrival to the app, guide yourself through the tutorial to get to know all the functionalities. And then once you enter the augmented reality environment, no matter where you are, it can be a room in your home, it can be a park, an urban surrounding a street or a forest, you can begin your journey through the exhibition. You will place the interface in space with the help of the markers and walk around it. 
13 nodes inspired by the symbiotic nodes formed by rhizobium bacteria and plant root systems are all interactive. When approaching them closely, they reveal the artwork each of them holds. You can see the nodes uh, have four different colors created in respect to four groups that the artworks were categorized by. Green for hybrid realities, purple for living systems, orange for tracing links, and red for shifting horizons. Okay. So um, I strongly encourage you to experience the exhibition and also, uh, of course, the biotechnology from the blue flower, because we know very well that the gene edited organisms cannot leave yet laboratories. But Anna's and Alex's virtual chicory blue flower, you can plant anywhere. And really, it's worth to do it. So, dear Anna, dear Alex, it is your evening. The virtual microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Joanna. And yes, absolutely. It's a wonderful exhibition and app that you've created at Art Science Node. And uh, yeah, have great fun planting the genetically modified chicory wherever you go, because um, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful to fill your world with these beautiful blue flowers. Um, <clears throat> First of all, we wanted to give a bit of an introduction to our project, although you've touched on it. Um, but but if we could talk it through first and then people have got a background in that and then we'll go into the discussion. Uh, so we'll just briefly describe the project. So in the. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Are you sharing. You stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Sorry, my collaborator here is uh, is uh, messing up the PowerPoint. So. Um, <laughs> to go forward to the next one. Right, so um, we went to, we first of all, um, we had some chicory roots sent over to us when we couldn't travel because it was the wrong time of year. And we're fascinated in, in this whole background of, of the chicory plant and exploring the, exploring the history of the flower and how it's entangled and linked in such a complex way to our perceptions of nature. And so this question of the, the unnatural that too is natural, which is attributed to uh, Goethe, but we can go into more of that later, uh, whether he actually said that. Um, and this is a chicory root. What's a chicory root? Um, it's a kind of uh, plant that can produce inulin, which is a kind of sweetener and dietary fiber that's very good for you. It's a prebiotic, so it encourages the bacteria in the gut um, and, and improves gut health generally. So positive, nice bacteria in the gut. And so this is this is one of the roots that we got sent in the post um, from Census, who are one of the consortium members. Um, and we did some experiments slicing through it and dyeing it with some textile dyes that I had at home, which were two different colored ones that could, could take up different, different fibers. And so this reveals in the blue, this is like the terpenes in the plant um, in, in the root there as well. So these are potentially medicinal things. So terpenes are like mint, menthol is a terpene and um, the sort of the um, essential oils, kind of those type of things are these medicinal terpenes. Um, and this is one of the um, chicory plants that we saw um, at Wageningen Plant Science in their big greenhouses there. And um, we just love this, this image that we took of it. And it seems to have so much drama to it. It reminds me quite a lot of Brunkusch's um, um, Passaraya Maestra, Master Bird. is kind of this great big sculpture atop a kind of plinth. Um, it really reminds me of that. I don't know why. Um, but it's this amazing, um, interesting plant that... Uh, we also tried dyeing silks and things like that with it. But this is this is the sort of key to what we were interested in. So although that's not a chicory plant on the cover of that book, Heinrich uh, von Offerdingen by Novalis, the German romantic writer was obsessed with this notion of the blue flower and wrote this unfinished novel. Um, he died, uh, I think, about the age of 20 of tuberculosis before he managed to finish the whole novel. Um, he he wrote about this idea of a mythical blue flower, which became the central form. And there's a lot of 
things in German kind of folklore about girls um, crying for their lost loves on the roadside. And as the tears fall, the blue flower springs up in its place and this became entangled and linked with this idea of the blue flower in German romanticism so it's probably likely that the blue flower is in fact the chicory plant as it has a stunning blue flower um, as you might see from the augmented reality app that we'll show in a little while um, so it became a central symbol of the Romantic movement in Germany. And the Romantic movement was set up in kind of opposition to the Industrial Revolution and those kind of things. They didn't like industrialization. They privileged nature above all else. And this idea of the blue flower went on to inspire Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who wrote his famous book, The Metamorphosis of Plants, where he lays out this idea of the Erdpflanzer, the primal plant um, from which all other plants kind of evolved. And he, he played a lot with these ideas. And he, he had said so many things. You can kind of go back through history of, of these amazing quotes that he gave, um, including this one, the unnatural that too is natural, which was attributed to Goethe. I actually tried to find the reference whether he actually said it. Um, and he didn't even know himself if he said it. So it was printed. It was, it was an article that was printed in Nature and it was by one author based on conversations with Goethe. And so Goethe said it sounds like the sort of thing he would say, but he wasn't sure if he said it. It's really interesting to think about these histories and all these kind of entangled thoughts. So I'll let Alex take over a bit now because <laughs> you're going to say some more about the, the 3D side. Yeah, and then I'll come back to the Goethe story. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the, the roots that we received... Um, it, and, and our sort of exploration of them, it, it sort of uh, time became a, a really important part of this. A couple of them had already started to decompose. The fact that there was it was sort of past the peak sort of season for harvesting them. Um, the fact that these were sort of these temporary objects was uh, something that that um, kind of we we were very aware of. So we we scanned them in three D. This is a this is a computer rendering of this one of the roots that we. Um, scanned in with the uh, photogrammetry in quite high detail and we, we took several of these to sort of digitally preserve them so uh, even though we ended up chopping them dying them i think we've still got some in our freezer somewhere got some dried ones got some dry, <laughs> dried for, for dying. Uh, we still have this this kind of record of of the original and and uh, this actually ended up being used for the ar app uh, so it's sort of gone on to have this this sort of extended life um, and we were sort of able to sort of look at the morphology of, of the uh, the root and just because this was quite early on in, when we uh, joined the, the project. And, and so it was a sort of way to uh, sort of accelerate our, our introduction to the uh, to these amazing. You should say here that this is the view inside. inside. <laughs> yeah, so so you, when obviously you've got it in 3D, you can zoom all around and you can zoom inside. So we were just sort of uh, preserving the surface of the um, uh, the root. Obviously, the the inside is is not uh, not preserved. But it's about it's about kind of seeing it in a new way as well. Absolutely. This this thing of you can travel through the root and you can see it in a new way. And we, I don't know if we got any photos, of it, but we did, we did actually did try and do a photogrammetry of the big plant as well that you took mm. the photo of, which was it was a difficult subject to uh, to take, as as was the flower that we uh, tried to scan as well. Uh, so small, so delicate, you know, it, it came out as this this sort of slightly mangled digital thing, but still preserving a kind of sense of the the original, but. Uh, but we sort of it really sent us on this this route working with uh, these very natural forms in this uh, digital way as well, which which sort of relates directly to the sort of subject that we're talking about. Uh, and this, I think, is finally this is the plant uh, that Anna showed that we scanned and then rendered as this sort of wireframe. So again, we're sort of traveling through into this uh, sort of very unnatural natural environment that that is is uh, entirely based from real world data but uh, being experienced in an entirely new way uh, from a sort of digital uh, through a digital medium and so um i mean 
we went and we worked in uh, Varnum Plant Science, Varnum University, and we worked with key gene and they worked with different methodologies in, in each location. And um, this is the way that they um, gene edit um, the chicory plants um, at Varnum University using agrobacterium, which can um, they can explain it better than I can, but it gets the, the genes into the plant, um, and which, which are knocking out um, genes, the genes that cause the bitter terpenes. So the way, the way it kind of works is that these, these roots have this amazing inulin, which is a dietary fiber. They have the terpenes, which can be used medicinally. But some of these terpenes are like the the protection of the plant, almost like their immune system that can sort of protect them against um, different um, parasites or something like that or infestations or different diseases. And so they are trying to remove some of them, but only a little bit in order to um, make the inulin sweeter and also to find other uses for these terpenes. So this is the way they do it with tiny sections of the leaf, which then are kind of put onto the um, petri dishes and from either the leaf or from even just a plant cell um, you can grow the whole plant and this is something Goethe talked about that the, the leaf produces the whole plant I mean a lot of the things that Goethe said were wrong um, and obviously he he inspired Darwin to um, to think about it in completely different ways and and evolution but, but he he influenced those people that came later so it's really fascinating to look back at about his kind of own ways of studying it because he was a he was an amazing pioneer of the kind of focus of art and science at the nexus of art and science and he even said that in the future he thought that art and science would come back together again and hopefully we're kind of um living his dream there um at key gene i was actually able to i think the agrobacterium method of crispr modification um wasn't possible to do in the short time that we were there at um Vining and university and the plan was to go back and maybe still is to go back and actually do that a bit more in depthly but during the pandemic situation we haven't been able to do that but just before the pandemic we were able to be a key gene and learn how to modify protoplasts with CRISPR and worked up with um, Robert Sevenier there um, and this is some sort of sort of mushed up um, they're trying to get the the individual cells out of the uh, chicory leaves and we are, I was actually able to work hands on with Robert in the key gene lab and actually start to CRISPR modify and do these knockouts on these individual plant cells, these protoplasts, which you can also see behind us, these incredible, beautiful things, um, um, which kind of contain all the information for the plant um, in each one. And this is... Um, this is using um, a sort of fluorescence microscope where it's actually showing these light up ones are the ones with the CRISPR modification, this cutting edge gene modification technique. Um, but I've done it in a few projects. I've done a few projects around these. Um, and we're also hoping to kind of do some stuff with 3D bioprinting next time um, we can get back to, with the colleagues at Key Gene. And I think you're going to talk about the um, the AR app, but just yeah, to conclude, um, the the sculpture that we're making that's that's the next step will combine three D printing, three D photogrammetry scanning, and kind of be a reliquary for the for the um, CRISPR modified leaves and cells that we collected during the project, um, which are now been you know, they've been stabilized, they're allowed to leave the lab. Um, so they're in a kind of killed form now. But but we have them and they will be relics in, in this sculpture, which will have a projection behind it, which is based on the latest best chicory genome. But chick plant genomes are huge because they have lots and lots of repeating sequences over time. So we kind of hypothesize that Goethe's Erdflanzer might be the original plant that didn't have the repeating sequences. So we're going to kind of create a genome, a chicory genome Erdflanzer, where we, we remove the repeating sequences from the genome, um, and that will be projected behind the object. So that, that's what the sculpture that we're making is going to be like, but we haven't quite finished it yet. 
<laughs> we still, we still got time. work in progress. <laughs> uh, but for the AR app, this is this is a screenshot of um, uh, from the app where uh, basically you can plant these wonderful chicory plants anywhere in the world. So these are these again are the leaves uh, that we scanned from the plants that we saw, then sort of re, you know remade into. Um, sort of uh, children of, of those plants, uh, sort of in a, in a digital way, of, anyway. Um, and you kind of visit the, uh, you know, the rhizosphere uh, and go to technology, uh, biotechnology for the blue flower, uh, and then just click, you will see the root kind of floating around um, the root that we scanned that we showed you earlier. And you just click on the screen and you will plant uh, a brand new chicory plant with flowers and uh, they sway in the breeze. And they're all different, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's, there's lots of different <laughs> versions in there. So you don't know which one you're going to get. Um, so, you know, you can do this in the lab, outside the lab, wherever you want. This and is... do send us, if you connect to us on social media, there's a link at the end. If you get some good pictures of it, um, do send them over, tag me um, or Alex on social media. And we'd love to see where you can take. And, and repopulate the blue flower. Mm. Um, um, obviously, Joanna's been through this uh, a lot, so we don't need to cover that. And that's our contact information. Um, Should you want to send any images over? Yeah. Or get in touch. <laughs> so. So it's about this idea of the um, of the chicory plant being in this sort of situation where it inspired romanticism and was a symbol counter to the industrial revolution but now in this biotechnological revolution that we're part of um it, it's a central kind of symbol again and that's what we're trying to create here we're trying to make it explicit that it's become this central symbol in this complex position and first of all i wanted to ask um can you tell um, us more about the Chick project from your perspective? I've tried to explain it, but I don't think as well as you would from the scientific side. So I would love to hear that. What are you each trying to do within the project and what are your roles within the project? Um, who would like to go first? I'll pick on someone if not. Hey, I can uh, start perhaps. So Derek, the coordinator. So yeah. The, the, the aim for us at the, in the project is to, to develop this, actually this small crop, it's small in the sense that it is a local crop, it's only grown in, 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 in the south of Holland, Belgium and France, and it has this potential to produce, or it produces inulin, but also terpenes, and to make that, uh, yeah, to make other varieties of plants that, that grow, um, that from which other products can harvest it. Well, that's the technological part, but there's also a lot of, um, we also emphasize how we to communicate uh, about it with, with, with everybody, with stakeholders. So we have a lot of uh, interactions going on with, with all kinds of stakeholders, the farmers, uh, the supermarkets, the regulatory people, because it involves genome editing, which is re regulated. And um, yeah, so, um, and, and my role in the project is as coordinator, is, I'm a biochemist by training, so, but that's not my, my role. I'm uh, yeah try to to link all these different disciplines which are uh, present in the project. So there are also people, uh, social scientists, uh, looking at uh, what uh, what will happen to job creation and or what will happen to the environment when we these plans are implemented, and to interconnect those disciplines and and see that they talk together and that it is. Uh, a good coherent project well and actually i don't have to do so much because they all <laughs> work very uh, very efficiently together that's uh, what i note uh, i also talk with with uh, with brussels that's also my role in in this not a biochemist but talk to brussels to eu officer yeah so that's uh, my role in the in this uh, chic project and katya you work in the lab and the more hands-on side at barningen university um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I am the I am a scientist in the same group as uh, Dirk, and actually together also with uh, Ingrid van der Meer and Hani Hackert, we work on the project, um, uh, working on two targets. 
And one is to really engineer the inulins that are in the chicory. So, you know, at the end of the season, many of these inulin molecules get degraded and the quality of the inulin is dropping. So one thing is that the chicory root would produce a lot of uh, um, very long chain, high quality inulin. And then uh, what is more my role in the project is the study of the terpenes. And the terpenes are so far not really exploited from chicory, um, but they have really interesting properties. Um, there is, if you look at the literature or if you look even the historical books, uh, chicory has been a medicinal plant for a very long time. And that is because of these secondary metabolites, the terpenes and the phenolic compounds that are in there. And um, Nowadays, we don't use these terpenes. Actually, when the inulin is removed, the terpenes are uh, discarded, but they have a lot of potential. And in my role is also to look at the, um, how actually these genes in the genome are organized uh, that are there for the production of terpenes. It's a very complex pathway, and we don't know all the steps yet. And you already mentioned uh, chicory genome has many, many duplications. Sometimes we see a lot of similar genes. We have to figure out which ones are playing a role in the plant. So we use uh, genome editing sometimes to uh, figure out which gene is involved in a certain uh, biosynthetic pathway. And sometimes we use those also um, to change the pathway so that we can get a different composition in the plant. And we work together with um, a lot of groups that are looking in bioactivity, and they have very nice results showing that chicory terpenes, in fact, uh, show high inflammatory activity, also antibacterial activity. And so we are especially focusing on that to make chicory plants that would make more of those medicinal terpenes. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Paul, um, could you tell us a bit more about your role at KeyGene and what you can work with? Sure, sure, I'd like to. So um, I'm actually the uh, World Package leader of World Package One, uh, the person who was doing it just retired, so I've taken over from him, but I've been involved with Sheik for, for a long time. Um, so in World Package One, we're focusing more on the technology side of the, uh, the project. Uh, in the World Package, we have a large number of different groups uh, spread around uh, Europe. And each group is kind of uh, working on the, the application of, of genome editing technologies in chicory. So when the whole project began, uh, it was a bit of an open question of, OK, could we actually apply uh, genome editing in chicory? And would this actually work? And, and how well would it actually work? So we decided at the start of the project to, um, let's say, apply uh, genome editing technologies. And, and the one we're using is CRISPRs to apply it in, in, in several different ways. Um, these are quite technical, but you can actually add the technology in different forms. And the idea was, okay, which is the most efficient form to achieve the outcome that we'd like to have? And so that's been going on now for uh, three or four years, um, quite successfully, I think. Um, when we first started the project, uh, we, we weren't quite sure how well it would work, but we've been quite lucky with chicory and it seems to be very amenable to these kind of manipulations. And that's allowed us to make a whole lot of uh, plant lines with mutations in different genes uh, that have uh, hopefully uh, some, some characteristics which are very, very interesting to, to breeders in the future. So that's kind of what we are, we're aiming at uh, now and, and in the next year or so. Excellent. And um, thank you, Paul. And Eric, you're also involved with the communication side and passionate about science communication. So can you tell us more about your role within the project? Yeah, thank you, Anna. Of course. Uh, well, I'm, I'm passionate about communication about plant breeding, you could say, or new technologies in plant breeding. And gene editing is definitely one of those technologies one should talk about or can talk about in order to find out whether or not we would like to use the technology to make, for instance, better chicory plants. So uh, I contribute to the communication. That means I contribute to both the sending parts or translating science into communication and also the other way around. 
Uh, so uh, hearing things from, from people, non-scientists and translating that for the scientists. And of course, I'm also involved in receiving uh, the, the artist in residence uh, at Kiji, uh, which is also very nice because, well, I've been uh, collaborating with scientists and uh, artists already for, for decades. And I think it's a very nice way to think about communication towards non-experts together with artists. So I love that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so we, we were thinking because the, to, to sort of lead onto the sort of main theme of, this, of the talk today, um, one of the things that, that struck us when, when we were there was the kind of how slow the process is because how, how long it takes to sort of grow these plants and, you know, and, and, um, and the techniques that you're using to, to do this, you know, are sort of, they're, they're um, sort of done in a, in a, in a way that the new plant breeding technologies. Uh, and we thought it'd be kind of useful for people sort of uh, watching this and understanding the, the, the thing uh, kind of coming up to sort of understand what that actually means and how that differs from uh, other modifications that, are, that you know, because we're, because we're talking about food and we're talking about uh, things that people might actually eat or, you know, uh, use in other ways. Um, what these techniques that you're using and how they how that actually works. Um, who would be best, Paul? Maybe. Or... I can answer your question. So I, I think uh, the the new plant breeding technologies that you're talking about that's a, a term that's been around for a while and includes quite a large number of different technologies. But I think um, the way we're trying to use it in the sheep project. Um, it more refers to uh, technologies which are able to introduce mutations into the genome. So these are technologies or, or reagents, usually proteins, in fact, that you can uh, have in, in the plant cell for a very short period of time. So people kind of call these things uh, molecular scissors. So then we're talking about technologies such as uh, CRISPRs, which I think people have heard a lot about recently. Uh, zinc fingers, uh, talons is another one. All of these technologies fall under this uh, new uh, plant breeding technologies uh, umbrella, um, but they all do basically the same thing. So the idea is that these uh, things go in there to a specific gene in a plant, uh, they cut the DNA, and by doing that, they actually um, make a change. So very similar to uh, lots of other technologies which have been used previously, um, such as uh, the chemicals or, or other forms of, of radiation, these kind of things, which uh, are not targeted to a particular sp uh, gene, but are more genome-wide. Um, those work too, and have been used for 50 years, but these uh, new plant breeding technologies are uh, quite new uh, but a lot more efficient because uh, you know you can you can select which gene you want to uh, change. Um, these are very powerful technologies, and uh, yeah, you said actually that um, you were surprised how slow things went. But uh, chicory is in fact one of the quicker plants that we we work with in terms of its life cycle and regeneration. So uh, we, we're very pleased with it. Um, so these kind of technologies have been discussed uh, a lot and uh, there's a lot of, of, of opinions about them, but I think we're very pleased that, that we have, get to work with them and, and to uh, try them out in, in plants in general. Yeah. I mean, uh, Katya, maybe you could say a little bit about the difference between uh, like the gene knockout as opposed to other forms of CRISPR where it's sort of gene insertion and kind yeah. of ethics and... Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Gene insertion, I know what you mean. Um, the catcher, sorry, Paul. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, that uh, one. Actually, the uh, CRISPR is actually directing uh, the, let's say, the scissor mechanism or the cut to a certain point in the genome. So that's the main difference from the other mutagenesis techniques. So we can very directly target one little piece of DNA and we 
or not introducing random mutations uh, during the whole genome, while you, you would later have to select for the one that you were aiming for. So that's the biggest difference. Um, but um, I think that's, the, that's why we call it a new plant breeding techniques, because you can direct the mutagenesis and you need much less selection. Um, can you repeat the question a bit? Because I think you asked a little bit differently. It was the, uh, obviously, in CRISPR and things, you can insert genes from oh, yeah. other forms. But. Yeah. Actually, in plants, we are mostly able to uh, make cuts into the genes, but the repair mechanisms of plants, they, they are not so much allowing for replacement of genes. That's very well working in bacteria. In plants, that's still more difficult. So what we can do is very directly uh, go to a gene and make a cut in it, but we cannot replace it so well. Uh, what we can do is prime editing at the moment in plants, and that means that we can substitute single nucleotides. So you can make changes, but to substitute a whole gene at, in the plant and really um, design it, uh, that is still quite difficult. So, but we can make small directional changes or we can inactivate one gene at the moment. So mostly we are using it like this. And uh, as I say, you can use it two ways. One is to inactivate a gene and see what, it, what is its function. Or if you already know which gene you want to target, you can inactivate it and see how that affects the production of terpenes or of inulins. And maybe Eric, um, because obviously, obviously the because you're just kind of doing uh, manipulations and knockouts of, of the existing uh, plant and not introducing anything. So, so basically, it's, it's sort of a technique which could happen in nature, but is highly accelerated. Is that, does that affect how you do the communication or the, the public's appreciation of, of the techniques? Well, it's one of the central issues, that's, that's for sure. It's... it's it's a kind of thing that could accidentally happen in nature. Uh, in case of Tanya and Paul, they know what the gene is they're interested in. So they know where they would like to have a new variant uh, and they want to induce that new variant and they can use uh, chemicals or radiation, but that would take a lot of time. So making this, this say, new variant inducing this new variant using CRISPR that is an amazing speeding up and making life much more easy. Imagine that when Katja would have an idea that at this place of the gene, when I would be able to induce a plant with a slight change, the chain of the, the, the shape of an inulin would maybe change. She could actually try that and use CRISPR to induce this variation, get a plant and see what, you, what shape the inulin, the new inulin has. Fantastic. And, and Dirk, maybe sort of the same question to you, but obviously like you, you're working in the sort of political arenas and, and sort of, you know, uh, is it, is it uh, sort of, I guess a sort of easier sell in, in a way? No, well, I'm not say I'm not working in a political arena. I must say, uh, no, I'm glad not. Um, easy sell? No, it, it's it's not so much an easy sell. So that's clear advantages, I think, in in the sense that you can work more directly. And as you say, I, I think plant breeding. If if you start breeding a plant and when you're finished and done with it, you might be lucky that you're still uh, not retired yet. If you start early, so so long it can take that long if you do the the old-fashioned way, I would say. But if you would do the 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 new way, the new planting, it can be much faster. That also means that you can introduce traits like a. Uh, uh, like like uh, resistant to pests or more healthy, what we do then in our project, much faster in in the plant and and uh, so that that is yeah that's in a uh, kind of obvious advantage that people see. But uh, yeah, there are also uh, people that think, okay, what is this new new method? How does it uh, how does it relate to uh, what we did before? Uh, yeah, and then we come to the the topic. I think of uh, is this natural or not? And um, yeah. 
So in that is the area where there is most discussion going on. Of course, there is also the safety. People think, okay, is this safe? But that those are things that you can test whether those plants, and that will be tested, of course, that is uh, part of, of what has to be done. Uh, so there are many aspects on, on uh, how, how this is, uh, these new technologies are, are viewed upon and also uh, how it is used, for what application actually it is used. Is it to make it more uh, sustainable, the, the agriculture, using less pesticides or water usage perhaps, or uh, making healthier trades? Those, those aspects are all important uh, to, to the people that you talk with, uh, what they think about the project. And that's what we try to get a, a view on how, what, what people find important and, and, and uh, what not and how to, yeah, to communicate with that and how people change or have a different opinions in that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you've, you've kind of started to touch on the sort of central question here of like, what is natural actually anyway? Um, because, I mean, we were having fascinating conversations over lunch, I mean, this is basically what we wanted to do here was kind of repeat for the public these amazing conversations we were having over lunch, which were complete eye openers to me, like at every step of the way. And like thinking that the current natural way of plant breeding is actually to expose them to radiation to create lots and lots of random mutations and then study them and keep doing this until you kind of find the traits that you want occurring and then kind of crossbreed them and this takes a very long time so there's this this method that you've that you're working with this CRISPR method um you do these kind of cuts and knockouts in the gene and it's something that could occur in this in this radiation type method that everyone seems to accept but they probably don't think about or know about when people say you know tomatoes have been irradiated they think that that's to kill the bacteria they don't realize it's part of this kind of growth um like production the plant the plant breeding technique so when you think about what people do accept and what they don't accept it, it kind of gets very complicated very quickly um about what the hell is natural and i think Katja showed me a set of images um, or when we first visited the lab of, of was it brassica? Um, and it was started with the mustard plant. Everything comes from this common mustard plant, like the cauliflowers and um, mm -hmm. cabbage and lots of different things. That you can name them much more than me, but I was completely surprised at that. It's just a one plant that's been through this kind of um, these breeding techniques and this is a way that you can do it kind of much faster so I, I would love to hear more of your views on this question of what the hell does natural act actually mean it's a term we bandy about so much oh that's not natural that is natural this is and as things are sold with beautiful natural thing it's it's this really loaded word that kind of doesn't mean anything anymore and i'd love to hear more of your views on that and maybe catch it because you you showed me these amazing things and started me off on this this thought process maybe you can talk a bit more about that yeah i think that what when we consider natural it should be something that has not been influenced by humans or caused by humans but when you talk about plants that have been cultured by humans, they they have been co-evolving with humans. And if you look at chicory, we know the wild chicory with the blue flower. But um, people have liked the bitter taste. They used it for coffee. Later, they made salad varieties, radicchio, uh, for example. Uh, here in the Netherlands, we have uh, witloff varieties. So this is a white chicory. Uh, we have uh, root chicory, the industrial one. These plants don't look like each other, but their genome is very similar. And through selection of seeds and through uh, crossing of varieties, we have arrived to a big diversity of plants. So are these plants still natural or not? I think that that's a matter of perception. So introducing uh, genetic modifications that has um, I think that has been happening since we had agriculture and since plant, plants became the food basis for the people. So in one way, we are depending on the plants. We have changed our environment to cultivate them, to feed them, to have the perfect conditions to grow them. And at the same time, plants have evolved with us. So there you can 
not uh, differentiate the limits so sharply anymore. So you cannot say plants are natural because they have been changed and modified by humans, if that's your definition. Mm. And it is this question of whether humans are somehow outside of nature. I mean, ants yeah. farm, don't they? But we consider them still part of nature. We don't consider sort of ants farming fungus as being outside of nature, but they do do these similar kind of things. Um, I think Eric had quite a lot to say on this theme as well. So I'm going to come to you now, Eric. What do you think about this theme? What, what does natural mean? You're muted. Sorry. Sorry, there I am again. Yeah, of course, I cannot re repeat the discussion we had because actually I'm not sure what I said, but I can tell you how it feels now. And, and indeed, natural can feel something like to, to persuade somebody to buy something or something like that, right? So you see advertisement of this is natural, so buy it. Uh, for, for me, uh, like Katja said, it's a very subjective thing. And it's very good that scientists like Evkijin and Wageningen realize that talking about what is natural and not natural is very important for people to decide on what they buy or how they feel about things. So understanding what people feel about what is natural is very important because it can help scientists to direct their innovations towards a, a direction that people will appreciate it when it's more natural. Great, thank you. Um, and um, Dirk, what do you have to say about this, this question of, um, I mean, and there's, there's, there's the whole politics of it. And then, I, I mean, I don't fully understand the current legislation so maybe you can speak a bit about the current legislation as well how it stands because there was a new ruling recently wasn't it that um yeah. say something about that please yes well so that but that's technical yeah there's indeed legal legal stuff i'm a, I'm a biochemist but uh, indeed those <laughs> genome edited plants that are made via CRISPR are regarded to fall under the same regulations as gmo plants which actually means uh, a, a lot because uh, you have to do a lot of tests and a lot of uh, before you can release release a, a plant in the environment. So that is uh, very costly and it has a lot of impact on whether or not this new breeding plant breeding techniques, CRISPR in, in this case, can be used actually or not. So um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's how it is. I read something, and I could be wrong, but I, I think I read something about how in in France that they were trying to regard the um, the plants that have been exposed to radiation as um, as under the same regulation of like the GMO. Is that something that's happening, or not that I'm aware of, to be honest? So, but I, as I said, I'm not an expert in in regulation, and I'm not not, not sure about that. So. Uh... I, I do find I do find the the concept of what is so we talked about is what is natural and, and uh, so then I think what you said in the beginning that everybody has its own perception of about what is natural and and so it's very difficult to talk to different people about how what is natural and that might also depend on the cultures or the countries that you come from so some some things that I find might find natural are perhaps not so natural for others. Uh, and, and yeah, so I find that, to, to, to be honest, I find that difficult to communicate about 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 natural. I, I, I prefer to say, okay, what I do now, would that be good for nature? Or would that be good for, for the sustainability? Or would that be good for the, the uh, your health? Well, for I, had, I had a, a weird conversation in um, in... Irvine, I did an art residency in the synthetic biology lab. It was called the Liu Lab for Synthetic Evolution at yeah. University of California, Irvine. And we we went out to dinner the night before and and it was like a first night in California. And I had this great big corn on the cob and I bit into it and I was like, this is amazing, delicious corn. And Alex said, genetically modified, isn't it? Um, 
And I was like, oh my God, it must be or something. And so I went into the lab the next day and I was asking the scientists that I was working with about this genetically modified corn because we were always told that it would be like tasteless or horrible or, you know, like that's that's the kind of the the idea um, that, that's been suggested over here in the UK by the UK press anyway. So I was eating this, I, so I told them this story about it and they said, what? you don't have genetically modified crops in the UK. And I was like, no, we're not allowed. And they, they said, but what about all the pesticides you must have to use? And so they actually saw it on the sort of the other side of the ethics as like it was morally wrong um, by their view to, to kind of not modify the crops and to use the pesticides, which I thought was quite interesting. Although mm -hmm. some of the crops that they use there, obviously the, the, um, the ones that are, the roundup stuff that's uh, you know resistant to that kind of stuff that gets into a very complicated area and actually is problematic for the whole communication of the field and the work that you do as scientists that kind of publicity stuff that happened in the sort of the 90s um that caused a lot of problems i think for the wider work of of working with um modify gene modification <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I think it reflects uh, what you're saying that in in the states, perhaps there's another culture and they they value different they value different things than than here, and uh, that can be a, a balance. Uh, and and uh, it, it's not only a matter of country, but also think of, of personality, but how you think about it yourself. So there's a lot of variation, and and but since the concept of what is natural is so undefined it is a difficult discussion because for me natural might be something different than for somebody else but i can appreciate that for some people it's very important that something is natural whatever that then may may mean <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well it's also like like when you go to the supermarket and you know the, the carrots have to be a certain size and a certain color and you know like this, this idea that we, you know, we don't want to buy any veg that's kind of like won wonky veg. They call they're trying to label it as wonky veg in the UK now, and um, and and so we we like our veg to be nice and clean and look the same, and and you know, which again isn't particularly natural. That's like we throw away everything which doesn't, or, or use it for other things. But but you know, we don't we throw away everything which doesn't fit this idea of what these fruits or plants uh, should look like. Uh, that doesn't seem very natural, you know. I mean, the carrots are orange, and that's something to do with um, the celebration of the Dutch royal family, as I understand it, isn't it? Or is that not a thing? Is that a fake? I never related it to car carrots, but uh, <laughs> to be honest, I, but, I uh, or orange, orange is no. Well. No, I read that they bred them orange to be like William of Orange or something. Oh, no, uh, I don't think so. But yeah, I, read <laughs> I think it's a nice story. It's a good story. I will. Uh, well, it just I goes to show all these kind of myths yeah. that go yeah, around. In fact, I'm going to Google that whilst, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, whilst maybe we go to it Paul. And they used it, but yeah. not developed it no. because of that. No. But anyway, we eat them because we eat them because. Of because of no. But yeah, Paul, what 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 about your views on all this this thorny subject of natural? Yeah, I, I think in terms of natural, um, indeed, it's quite an undefined uh, concept. Huh? I mean, um, I, I think if you compare the idea of natural versus organic, for instance, huh? I mean, if we're talking about labelling everything that's organic has to fit a certain rules, there's a lot of control over what could be called organic. And, and that that has you know uh, rules which everyone can follow, whereas nat natural isn't actually a protected word. So anything, any food stuff can be labelled natural. It doesn't have to follow any kind of uh, pre-prescribed uh, method of production. So that's why uh, you know you'll see a natural uh, Mars bars and, and natural uh, well, these kind of things. So that's one th thing I think about natural, and and also I mean. The idea of nature, of course. What is nature? I have no idea. It's also undefined. Is it the, your garden? Is that nature? Is, is the bottom of the sea nature? So I think uh, I, I do have problems with this concept of natural. In, 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 and I think that's where people get very uh, confused. I did like your example of the broccoli, for instance. I mean, I think uh, if you're talking about plant breeding, and is that natural to create such a wide uh, range of different plant species through breeding? 
but I see it in the same way as, as what we've done to dogs. I mean, we don't find it strange to look at uh, tiny chihuahuas and enormous uh, uh, Great Danes, but they are the same species. And is, is that natural? I guess most people would say it is. And so I, I think, you know, if, if you use very relatable kind of concepts of, of nature in terms of what people uh, do like and, and where the variation has been introduced, I think perhaps uh, if we look at it positively in the future, people will be more accepting perhaps in, in uh, other ways to introduce uh, variation in, in uh, in nature, in, in what we would consider to be a natural way, yeah. uh, through, of course, all the gene editing the stuff that we actually use. Because with the gene editing, um, you can make these changes, but you don't have to use the chemicals and the pesticides in so many ways, because you can kind of, you can work with yeah. that, so we can avoid yeah. that, and we could have a more kind of that one sustainable thing. And another thing that kind of springs to my mind is this issue of climate change, because with crispr modification and things like that is that we can actually make plants or you can anyway um make plants that um might be more like drought tolerant or heat tolerant or something like that so in a way it might be something like we've had to do with like with with the covid vaccine and that sort of stuff that's been made using these very new technologies in a very short time um that we will we're gonna have to think about the using these technologies and think more broadly about it because it's there's going to be an element a, a point where it's going to become very urgent definitely i think it's a good example with the the, the chemicals that you normally would add to plants i mean i think there's a good uh, uh, argument to say that perhaps organic culture should use more of these kind of techniques to create uh, plants which don't need uh, these chemicals anymore um, and I think that's a discussion. I, I think certain people who are in that field, I think, do agree. And I think it's starting to get a lot more uh, traction than it did before. So hopefully in the future, uh, people will come around to this uh, way of thinking. Yeah, definitely. I think the catcher, did you have something else to say? Oh, Eric had his hand oh, up. Oh, Eric. Yeah. Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> who wants uh, to go first? Yeah, thank you, uh, Anna. I think it's maybe good to say that uh, scientists, we scientists using uh, gene editing, we don't say that we can do the tricks use gene editing. It's just one of those tools that plant breeders would like to use. So developing plants that are better able to cope with climate change, uh, it's, it's not that gene editing is the magic wand or something like that. It's, it's, it's one of the tools that some of the breeders would like to use to induce new variants, new variations, or maybe uh, yeah, variations that could be useful, for instance, in developing plants that can fight drought or cope with drought. But it's not the only one technology or the, the magic one, right? Good point. Does anybody else got something to say on? To come back to anyone speak now yeah i wanted to say something still that um, we can apply them uh, to have less pesticides or to increase the resilience of plants in the environment but we have also a new philosophy in how we evaluate our food so we are not only looking at the nutritious value but we are looking at the functionality of the food so the food is also stimulating your gut flora or it's important which kind of plants you choose or which compounds are there uh, when you're looking at uh, lifestyle diseases like obesity and diabetes and even there CRISPR or new plant breeding technologies they can be a tool where we can make not only more food but we can make healthier foods mm. yeah it's very important um point thank you um I mean, it's, it's using these technologies to do sort of targeted changes rather than mm. i mean especially with the sort of radio radiation technique where it's, we'll just sort of see what happens and hope it goes in the right direction and uh well, this is much more scientific yeah, but it's, that's what I mean. It's, it's sort of you can target and, and aim for the, the things that you're actually mm. trying to get to. Um, so do you think that people are 
resistant to this idea of CRISPR um, with the gene knockouts, this sort of stuff? Or And why do you think that might be maybe a question to Dirk? I keep giving you all the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> why people are resistant? What are you asking about people are resistant or what will happen? Are they, well, no, also- I was thinking about um, what is the resistance to to the idea of gene editing? I, I mean... I wonder if it's to do with this sort of the um, the issue with Monsanto, um, which there's a but film out now recently and things like that. This sort of influence of this idea and this notion of Frankenfood that um, Greenpeace introduced in response to this this issue with Monsanto. Um, yeah, well, I think it's very important that people uh, that that people see or realize or uh, are explained that that. That it might have a benefit for what the trade what you introduce that it's beneficial for them, and then uh, yeah, I'm always amazed what the risk people may take uh, using uh, things like Facebook or, I mean, if, if they see a benefit, uh, not and I won't compare uh, genome editing with, with Facebook, <laughs> but but I, that's that I think is key. If people see a benefit to 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 something, then they will uh, yeah they will look at it differently than when they don't see the benefit. Then then yeah, what is there to to profit for them? Uh, it might only be. In, in the best case scenario or, uh, or in the worst case scenario might be a, a risk. So mm. that's important that you do something that benefits either themselves or their environments, their, the nature that they live in, or that it is clear that what you do has a clear benefit. Mm. And, it's and, very- that, and that's what we are actually want to do in the Chic project. That's why, why we chose actually also this crop and also the traits, the, the, the things that we want to improve in this, in this, in the chicory. And this is something that farmers would be able to use. Um, it wouldn't be like locked down, like when Monsanto sell these bags of corn that are then patented and all this stuff. There's a new movie out. That we, Percy. Is it called, what's it called? Percy. Percy. There's a new movie out um, um, about this whole court cases in America, what happened to the farmers there. But it, this is this is because it's through universities, not a commercial thing in the same way, um, and through different research organizations it's not that 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 is something that wouldn't happen in this situation isn't it i cannot predict that but i no, there is no reason to do that actually i think there are more uh cases now because it is it's it's less expensive so also the, the let's say for the smaller crops and smaller farms and so smaller companies can can uh how do you call it can uh, permit themselves or can uh, take can do it and not only when you are a very uh, rich multinational. So mm. yeah, no, so I don't okay. see it. It's I don't see that is per, uh, per se uh, beneficial for bigger companies and not for smaller. No. So so that's that's interesting. So the technologies that you've been developing are things that people can also do, like small scale breeder plant breeders can do in their own mini sort of greenhouse laboratories as well using these techniques. In some uh, cases. Perhaps yes, but but for example, the the chicory crop is a small crop. Mm. It is is it in small in the sense of that it is grown on 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 uh, small areas and 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 actually the the, the amount of uh, the money going in in this uh, is is not a lot. So mm. yeah, it's, mm. it's not like corn or soy or mm. uh, or cotton these, these mm. big crops. It's always a question that comes up that sort of thing when when we're discussing it. So I wanted to kind of get it out there and and talk about it. <laughs> and uh, want to ask one last one. Mm. So uh, obviously, this, this is these are sort of um, very deep, sort of cultural, societal issues that that you know your research touches upon and, and impacts upon, um, and it you know needs to engage people, uh, many different kind of uh, groups of people and different across different countries and different cultures and everything. Um, so why did you choose as a consortium to involve artists in the team? You ask me again. <laughs> My mic is open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go. Um, you're, okay. you're on the roll. Okay, so yeah, well, I think because we we we, we know that that communication and interaction with the particularly with the the, the society, the consumer, so. Uh, the, the general public, so to speak, is uh, is very important, is key. And and as scientists, we are known to 
how to communicate, but particularly with other scientists, usually sending out information, explaining things how we see it. And uh, I think uh, uh, artists communicate uh, in a different way uh, with, 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 their, with people by uh, showing their artworks. Um, usually there is some emotion, I think, in involved. And it is not so much in, in explaining things, but it is just to visualize things and to provoke a discussion, which is perhaps, um, yeah, I don't know where it will end, but to me, it is at least, at least an, a new way to communicate in what we are doing. And uh, yeah, I, of course, it, I hope it will help. And, uh, that, and, and yeah, that's, that's the reason why uh, for me to, to introduce artists, it's a new way of communicating in, in, in a more... Uh, uh, let's say open manner, interactive manner. I hope. <laughs> I but, but we will see what happens to your artworks. <laughs> <laughs> so put it back to you. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, and Katya, maybe you could uh, say something about that. Yeah, for me, sometimes if I try to explain what I'm doing to my family or to my friends. Uh, I start with DNA and proteins and how it all works and I immediately lose my audience. So it's nice to, because these proteins are difficult to visualize or DNA is difficult to visualize. If you don't work with these things, they are very abstract actually. And, and thinking about it with somebody else, uh, with you coming in and you're fascinating by how the plants grow and how you can show what we are doing in a completely new way. So we don't start telling the story with the DNA and the cutting, but we tell the story from the fascination about the plant that grows from one cell and about the effects that we are getting by doing our, our research. So for me, it's a really nice learning experience and it's nice how to learn how you see uh, our work and how you describe it. It's really uh, much more colorful than we are normally doing. Eh? We are getting immediately into the technical details. So this is also for us as scientists, it's a very nice experience. Yes, I would like to confirm that. Is <laughs> whether it's uh, whether it will be useful in the end, I, I do believe so, but it <laughs> is really a nice experiment, uh, experience to, to collaborate with, uh, with artists. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. well, for us too. <laughs> Collaborate with scientists. Yeah, not to well, other artists than most of us. <laughs> Collaborating with Joanna. <laughs> She's an artist. And uh, Paul? No, I, I absolutely. I think uh, I agree with what uh, Dirk and Katja have said. I mean, I think uh, when we think of what we do, we think very much in terms of figures. Uh, you know, uh, we, we have a very fixed way of thinking of, of, of our work and, and, and how, you know, we kind of share the same ideas as scientists. And I think uh, you guys have a, perhaps a completely different take on, on, on the, uh, the whole concept. Uh, you come with, uh, let's say, concepts which we would not uh, uh, be able to think of. It's just not the way that we think. We've been trained in a certain way and, and you uh, can bridge that, um, I, I think, uh, that figure-like area that we think of with perhaps a, a completely new area, which is, is nice to see, definitely. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, value there, I think. Thank you. And Eric, please. Yeah, I totally support uh, all the others. And uh, well, my, my working together with artists started uh, when artists uh, contacted us uh, to hear about research, to be inspired to make paintings or photographs. So I think we, I've been receiving artists for, for 20 years or something like that. When they asked to come to me, to our institute, to our business, to our enterprise, to be inspired by research. And at a certain moment, uh, it went also the other way around. And so at a certain moment, I was wondering how to explain what biodiversity in plants can mean and uh, to know, to understand biodiversity. And then I asked a bunch of artists, independent minds with a complete different take, like Paul said, complete different take of what is biodiversity in plants anyway. 
and say that, and they made a, a great exhibition in a park and i think that it allowed a lot of people to have a total different angle towards this studying biodiversity and plants so i totally like this different angle and this independent mind who goes towards a direction i would never predict thank you it's very it's very similar to um to how we experience going into the lab because it's completely different things that we would never kind of get to see is like I until like the early discussions with Joanna I hadn't thought about working with plant science but actually it fits in so much with so many of the other projects that I've done and adds a piece of knowledge to it that kind of ties so many things together and all this stuff of the history of plant science as well so it's fascinating um we've got a couple of questions um I think so we've got one about um nor plant plant nor plant science MSc scholar from the University of Milan and UGA Grenoble asked, terpenes production in chicory, is it controlled by any plant hormone? If yes, how see the knockout plant if it has a pleiotropic effect? I don't even understand the question. Um, <laughs> That's a pretty techy question. But who would like to field that for us? <laughs> Shall I uh, answer yes, it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's true. The production of uh, terpenes is normally regulated by hormones and then uh, transcription factors are active that induce the production of these compounds. But actually, we did not uh, interfere with this pathway of signaling, but we looked uh, really at the biosynthetic pathway. So what we do is actually uh, we inactivate the first dedicated biosynthetic enzyme in that pathway, which means that the rest of the pathway cannot run. And um, that's why we, that's uh, the way that we don't see a lot of effects um, from the hormones, let's say, in our plants. We do see differences uh, between different plants because, um, um, as Anna mentioned, there is a lot of duplication in the genome. So actually this gene that is uh, coding the enzyme that makes the first step in the biosynthesis is there in eight copies. So it depends on which copies you're inactivating. Um, that that's actually um, directs how much terpenes are produced by the plants. I think this should answer the question. Fantastic. <laughs> but we did not direct the hormone levels, let's say. If, if anybody uh, that's listening has got any questions, then do type them in there. Q and A or the chats, and um, we'll and we'll get them. Joanna's got a question. Yes, I got the question. I think it's time to pose the question to Anna and Alex, <laughs> also. <laughs> uh, but maybe I will say uh, one more more words about the uh, very important role uh, of artists in a scientific environment, because I think that uh, not often scientists are thinking how about the day cultural uh, impact that they are an important that the science is a, a very important cultural factor and i think that the, the work like um, uh, by biotechnology from the blue flower shows it perfectly and i would like to ask uh, anna and alex yet about the uh, i think that very interesting aspect of your work um, concerning this idea of prime plant and you somehow want to go back to it uh, by um, uh, virtually manipulating <laughs> the DNA of the chicory mm. to gain again this uh, ur plant and I wonder uh, how uh, what will be the processes and what our scientists are thinking about it if it's possible to create this ur plants or your plants? I think the, the plan is to go through the genome and write some code that will find the repeating sequences and then remove them. Um, but we still need to go back to speak to <laughs> Katya and her colleagues um, about exactly what that means when it's a repeating sequence and just to really nail down the the yeah, what we're actually deleting. 
And then, I mean, it would be fascinating to know if we could actually make using CRISPR, not yet, obviously, I realise it's going to cost hundreds of millions of pounds to do it. But if we could theoretically, theoretically make an Erpflanzer CRISPR, um, an original plant with no repeating sequences, what would that look like? Some kind of weird thing or will it look like the same plant? Who knows? Did would, you want to say something about the programming side? Or the... Um, no, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think the, the, it's, it's that idea about, you know, that, that, that if we took all this sort of repeating stuff out, that that would somehow sort of be this kind of cleaner version. And it, and it really ties into that whole thing here about specifically like, you know, the, the perfect vegetable, the perfect fruit, the perfect, you know, the, that we just get rid of all the, the things, we take away all the things that, that we consider not uh, desirable in this thing. And, and uh, But this, this changes over time. And I mean, one of the reactions to the development of the COVID vaccine, as we all know, is, is there are people who think that it was developed too fast uh, and we, they're not ready to take the vaccine because how could they possibly develop it to that fast and this is the point with these technologies is is that this they're, they're so targeted and so sort of uh you know like like lasers you know in their accuracy uh that that we can achieve that so if, if you've got these massive changes occurring within people's lifetimes and and sub lifetimes then you know uh people aren't necessarily ready to accept natural and mm. you know what what actually is natural and will actually uh, gravitate towards the ideas of the of the past um you know and and mm. you know so it's it's and we're holding all that at the same time in society uh you know we're, we're not all of the same mind you know we, we have to account for all these different viewpoints mm. I mean, with with the COVID vaccine and the speed, just to clarify, as anyone's listening that is worried about that sort of thing, because that's that's something that's quite close to my heart is having people like not confused by these sort of things. It was the it was the advent of whole genome sequencing, which is a technology that this whole project is benefiting from as well, which allows them to develop the vaccine quickly because they had the whole framework of the vaccine. They just needed to know the the genes for the spike protein, which could be inserted into the into the vaccine and that's why and then it was just a question of testing it and getting it produced so it was a, it was actually and should have been a very quick process but it's never been done before like that it, it reminds me as well of some of the I mean what we're talking about this removing genes and taking it back to the original the original natural thing is that I did the project called make do and mend where um back in 20. 16, 2017, I removed um, an antibiotic resistance gene from um, an E. coli and in theory, taking it back to its pre-antibiotic era um, self, you know, it was, it was ampicillin resistant and I removed that and I re re replaced it with the phrase make do and mend written into its genome because with bacteria, they don't have these repair mechanisms like plants, you have to actually physically repair them. And now I'm working um, with scientists at um, the Wellcome uh, Sanger Institute on a cholera bacterium from 1915, which is the world's oldest living cholera weird thing but anyway it's frozen uh freeze-dried and has been kept in a freeze-dried state and then recultured and it, it's the actual organism um and it's penicillin resistant it's antibiotic resistant and it predates the antibiotic age so it very nicely demonstrates that antibiotic resistance even though it's something that humans are driving actually existed before the antibiotic age because they were resistant to each other. So they were, it was resisting the molds and things. So it's, it's these things of going back in history and then thinking about the future. And I think that's why this idea of the Erpflanzer and this, this, this theory by Goethe of this original plant from which all other plants evolved um, was, was so appealing, I think. But we still need to really get into the nitty gritty of the genomics of it, but we will do it properly. And uh, we've got a bit of time to do that still, so we're still working on it. Thanks, Joanna, for that question. Um, well, I hope that all scientists will support you to make this prime chicory. <laughs> yeah. Primal chicory.
Um, just to get, we we had um, apart from the question that you just asked, which was pretty much the same question. We had a comment from Eva Suve who said the discussion is so interesting on so many levels. The question of the natural and the importance of the collaboration between science and art. Um, so I think that's a that's a sort of lovely thing. I think to conclude on. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, um, I would like to thank all the panelists from our perspective and um, I would like to thank Joanna for her wonderful introduction as well um, and so thank you everyone and thank you for everyone for listening okay but before we will leave this floor I would like to ask you the personal question all of you because now it will be the you know serious thing and you have three choices when you think about yourself are you natural, unnatural, or unnatural that is too natural? So we start with, let's say, artist, Anna, Alex, then Dirk, Katya, Paul, Eric. <laughs> um, I'm going to be unnatural that is, uh, that too is natural. It's quite a difficult quote, and I've yeah. seen it translated as the unnatural that is still natural, which I think is probably cool. better. And we don't know, and Goethe didn't even know if he said it himself, which is, it's sort of, is that natural? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? Yeah, probably the same. Same? Yeah. Dirk? Maybe that's an artist thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, at the start I was natural, but then I became uh, the, the, yeah. the, Goethe, the Goethe one. <laughs> <laughs> And Katya? Yeah, I think also. Uh, maybe at the start natural, but then with the help of medicines, vaccines, uh, nice food, uh, I became a little bit uh, a mix, I guess. <laughs> Paul? Uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I also thought natural to start with, but I'll, I'll just stick with unnatural and be a bit different. <laughs> and Eric? Well, some people say that in dancing, I am a natural, but that's different. That's not what you mean, I think, I guess. So I, I think I, 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 I pretty much feel the same like, like Dirk and, and Katja say. I, I may have started out as something more or less natural. Of course, selection has taken place in human beings as well. It's natural. My parents chose each other based on chemistry. Well, sounds like natural. I was born from my mother, well, more or less natural. Uh, but after that, a lot of things happened to me and to my life that made me a bit of a natural, I guess. I, I think to go, thanks to medicine, I'm still here. And this medical compound, I'm not sure whether this medical compound is a natural compound. I think it is a synthetic compound and I'm still here. So, yeah. <laughs> So thank you all for the questions. And uh, I would like to pose to the whole audience to take that questions home. And so we are coming to the sad moment, to the end of this meeting. And I would like to thank so much to Anna and Alex, as well as to Dirk, Katya, Paul and Eric for the informative and also stimulating discussion as well as for the engagement in artists and science synergy. So vital, I think, in our times. And thank you for your cooperation, for openness, your courage and enthusiasm for sharing your knowledge experiences, but also for inspiring others. And I would like also to express my gratitude to Macarena Sanz and Ronald Tipan for their support in organizing and promoting this event session and all Chick partners for the wonderful work and for the support for of artists in residence program. And special thanks, of course, are going to all of you who join us today for this memorable art and science talk. And before I will say goodbye, I would like to encourage you again to visit the exhibition, Capture the Futures, our biotech planet at the Plant Biology Europe 2021, to experience the application, plant your virtual chicory root, and also stay with us 
with Art and Science Synergy Program of Plant Biology Europe, we are finishing tomorrow with an exciting insight to the future of STEAM education, bridging science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. So join us for the webinar panel discussion tomorrow at 6 p.m. on Zoom platform, and we will discuss the role of art and science and technology education. And now, thank you again, and have a nice evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.